I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is episode 27 of my series on the JFK assassination. You'll recall that in the 1990s, people discovered the existence of a top-secret CIA manual that had been developed in 1953 in the run-up to the CIA's regime change operation against Guatemala, and specifically the democratically elected president of that country. And there was an assassination list, and so CIA was clearly studying the art of assassination and equally important, the art of covering up its role in the assassination. And one of the interesting aspects of that manual is that it omits what would naturally be a way of covering up an assassination or a murder uh, that any reasonable person would think about. And that would be framing a person. I mean, that's pretty much standard in terms of cover-ups of roles in murders. Uh, we know that people are framed sometimes. Uh, we see it on TV, at least, but in, even in real life. And like several years ago, the, the, uh, there was a law enforcement officer in Texas in a little town called Talia where, who framed, I don't know, several, lar a large number of African Americans on drug offenses. You know, he took the stand and said, I had these drug deals with them, and they were denying it. They were very poor people. And... Um, judge uh, or the jury convicted them. They were, many of them were sent up for long prison sentences for drug dealing. And then it was later discovered that this guy had framed them all. It was all false testimony. Uh, and so they had to reverse the convictions and so forth. But, you know, a good frame is where you, you're setting everything up so that the person that's claiming his innocence can't get out of it, that, that the frame is too tight. And, and it worked in that case. And, and we also know about, you know, dropsy cases in the, in the drug war where law enforcement people don't like a guy or they, they're convinced he's a drug dealer, but they can't catch him. They just drop drugs in his car or whatever in his house and say, oh, see, I found drugs. And then when they go to trial, the prosecutor says, you know, who are you going to believe, this upstanding police officer or this long-haired drug dealer here? And, and so... That's how they frame people with dropsy cases in the drug war. So people are framed. But interestingly enough, framing is not part of this, this manual. And I mean, these people in the CIA are brilliant. You know, how could they overlook the possibility of framing a person as a way to cover up uh, their role in the assassination? And so that caused me to wonder whether they didn't cleanse this manual uh, when it was had to be released in the 1990s. Remember, this is during the time of the Assassination Records Review Board, which was enforcing the JFK Records Act, which was mandating that everybody release their JFK records. Uh, so I wonder whether they, they deleted that because it hit a little bit close to home. Because remember, the accused assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, was claiming not only that he was innocent, but that he was being framed. That's what he meant when he said, I'm a patsy. Now, remember the mainstream motive and the Warren Commission motive for Oswald supposedly killing Kennedy, that he was a little man trying to become a big man by killing a big man. Well, if that's the case, you would think he would be bragging about it. You know, stand up there saying, I'm a little man, but now I'm a big man because I've killed a big man. <coughs> he doesn't do that. Instead, <coughs> excuse me, he denies doing it. Now, I don't know what the what the theory here would be, but I guess it would be, that he's a little man that wants to be a big man by killing a big man, but deny that he did it and then get acquitted. And then maybe after the acquittal, he says, oh, well, I'm the guy that really did it, but double jeopardy prohibits me from, from being tried again. And so I'm a big man after all. Well, that's possible, but it seems to me very complicated, very convoluted. Uh, and here's the other interesting aspect of this thing, though. You know, when a person is accused of a crime and he's innocent, he ordinarily would just say, I, I didn't have anything to do with this. I don't know who did it, but I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm, I'm innocent of this thing. Oswald didn't do that. I mean, he did that, but he did something else. He said, I'm being framed for this. I'm a patsy. That's what he meant when he says, I'm a patsy. He, he meant, I'm being framed by somebody, which obviously means that in the hours after he was arrested, he was thinking, 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 what's going on here? And he comes up with the, the idea that there's a group of people framing him, making it look like he has committed this crime. Now, if you were trying to 
figure out a way to to pin a crime on somebody like an assassination of a president, who would be the type of person that you would want to be framing for this? Well, remember, this is the Cold War. This is the anti-communist crusade. This was the 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 you know national security state, uh, the, the Cold War, trying to protect us from the worldwide communist conspiracy that was based supposedly based in Moscow. They were coming to get us, uh, and so there was this this obsession with looking and finding looking for and finding communists all in American society. I mean, that was what the prosecution of Dalton Trumbo the, and the Hollywood aid was all about. It was what the Hollywood blacklist was all about. You know, people with communist leanings or communist affiliations. Uh, remember that famous question at the McCarthy hearings? Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And if you said yes, or if you took the Fifth Amendment, your career was over because nothing could be worse than to be a communist during this period of time. And, and the CIA and the FBI were both infiltrating the U.S. Communist Party and trying to destroy it, even though ordinarily in a free society, people have a right to expound any political views they want. I mean, that's the essence of a free society, uh, no matter how unpopular the views are, not during the Cold War, that you couldn't espouse communism because they were coming after you. And remember, they have the power of assassination now. And this is what the assassination attempts that they were being made when Arbenz was, was being targeted or his people in his regime were being targeted. They still won't give us the list of, of which people were being targeted. Remember, they targeted uh, Patrice Lumumba for assassination. And so, you know, it, it really wasn't safe for anybody to be a communist during the Cold War at the hands of the U.S. national security state. They suspected there were communists in the army. They suspected communists in the State Department. And, you know, if, if you got affiliated with communism, your career was in jeopardy. I mean, there were if your employer happened to be right wing conservative, you were done. You were fried. Uh, you were gone. So nothing could be worse than be to be labeled a communist. And so obviously the best person to frame is a communist. Why? Well, because nobody's going to come to his defense. Nobody's as stupid. Because if you come to his defense or you just question the official version of that's that's framing him, that's putting him in that position, you will then be smeared as a communist sympathizer. And that's exactly what they did when there were some of the early researchers that were questioning the official version of, of events. Immediately the CIA starts saying, oh, communist sympathizer, aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. And that was the strategy uh, because... That's, you know, to be associated with communism, that was that was done. And, and if, in fact, it actually worked. Many of the very prominent leftists uh, refused to even get involved in this and accepted and swallowed the official story right off the bat and never questioned it, never looked back, even to this day. Uh, because, you know, there's a gradation between a standard liberal, progressive, socialist, communist. Uh, and many of the leftists are, were associated and are associated with communism because it's hard to draw that line between well, what's a leftist, what's a progressive, what's a socialist, what's a communist. And in the eyes of many of the right wingers, your standard leftist was you know suspect. And remember Martin Luther King, uh, he was a civil rights leader. He he was considered well not considered. They knew they they were convinced. That, that Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement was the spearhead of the worldwide communist conspiracy to take over America, and that part of that conspiracy was to disrupt things here in the United States. So, but here's the challenge. If you're going to use a communist, how do you get a communist in the right position? I mean, you can plan the parade route, and you can plan the assassination, which is complex in and of itself. It's a military operation. It's got to be planned out. It's got to be orchestrated. You've got to practice it. But how do you get the communist in there? You know, you go out and do a survey of buildings and say who works here and who's a communist and then hope that he works in the building where everything's opportune? Almost impossible. So what's the second best? The second best is to find an intelligence agent, young intelligence agent, who, whose public portrayal is that he's a communist. And that would be Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, we've already discussed how Oswald, all the all the evidence, the circumstantial evidence, that confirms that information that Warren had received that he was sharing with the commission at that top secret meeting. I mean, here's a guy that's in the Marines. You know, how many communists do you know who are Marines? Not very many, I think. And why would a communist join the Marines? They had just killed millions of people in the Korean War, 
and and they could have been called back up to fight communists and kill communists in, in Korea because the, the war was just suspended. And the, the, but here's a, a communist that's going to go kill communists. He's learning Russian, fluent Russian in the Marines. You can't do that without a mentor, a tutor, or a language school, all of which they have in the U.S. military. He, he was studying Marxism openly in, in, in the military. His buddies are, were calling him Osvaldovich. Now, what are the chances that the U.S. Marine Corps is going to leave a committed communist in their midst when the whole Cold War is out there finding communists and prosecuting them, smearing them, and destroying them? I mean, it goes back to that parallel universe I was talking about earlier. Uh, and then, you know, he goes to the Soviet Union, and, and clearly he's going as an infiltrator. And, and they did have infiltrators. They had infiltrators for the Communist Party. They had infiltrators for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And, it, and if you're an infiltrator, you got to know your stuff because you're acting like a communist. And so you got to behave like a communist. You have to convince the communists that you're more communist than they are. So you got to be well trained. You got to study it. And that's what, what Oswald clearly was doing in the military. So he becomes an infiltrator into the Soviet Union, which the CIA and the military and the NSA were obsessed with, much more obsessed with Russia then than even now. I mean, multiply the obsession with Russia today by about a thousand. So, you know, and, and, and the Russia was a totally, the Soviet Union was a totally closed off society. So they, they get an agent in there to report what are the conditions and so forth. Well, he comes back and it was essentially red carpet treatment. There's no grand jury subpoena. There's no treatment like Edward Snowden or John Walker Lind. I mean, nothing like that. Uh, he goes, to, he go, comes to Dallas. He works for a, a photography firm that has top secret photography for the U.S. government. He's mentored by a right wing guy that's got intelligence written all over him named uh, Morinshield. And, uh, then he's shifted to, to New Orleans, where he has these fascinating uh, uh, experiences. He goes to work for a right-wing owner of a coffee company, the Riley Coffee Company. I mean, this guy was hardcore to the max, anti-communist, anti-Castro, and he's going to hire Lee Harvey Oswald, who's supposedly a communist. He uh, Oswald uh, goes into the offices. He is seen going to the offices of Guy Bannister, retired FBI agent. And, and then he's got pamphlets that he prints up. Nobody knows where he got the money to do it uh, That for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Because remember, the CIA and the FBI were trying to infiltrate and destroy the Fair Play for Cuba, Cuba Committee. And Oswald stamps the return address as the address where Guy Bannister, the FBI agent, is. And he had to have gotten reamed out for that. And so he's out on the streets, you know, pamphleteering for the Fair Play for Cuba, Cuba Committee. And then he t tries to tie in the Fair Play for Cuba Committee with the Communist Party in order to smear the Fair Play for Cuba Committee with the Communist Party. Because remember, the objective was to destroy these organizations. He makes contact with the DRE, which is a fierce anti-communist Cuban exile uh, organization that was being secretly funded, unbeknownst to the Warren Commission, by, uh, by the CIA. In fact, the CIA kept that secret not only through the Warren Commission, but all through the House Select Committee hearings and the Assassination Records Review Board. And, and Oswald offers his service to them. He says, hey, look, I've got my Marine Corps manual. I'll help you guys against Castro. And then the very next day, he flips again, and he's out on the street pamphleteering, and he has this, this altercation with the head of the DRE, a guy named Carlos Bringer, and it's as all the earmarks of a fake fight. And Oswald gets publicity, though, and he ends up in jail for disorderly conduct. He asked to see a FBI agent of all things, and the FBI agent actually goes. Uh, you know, you know, like an FBI agent's really going to take his time to go visit a communist who's in jail for disorderly conduct. So he has Oswald has intelligence agent FBI all, written all over him. Now remember what's happening over here with Kennedy. Kennedy on June tenth, nineteen sixty three has thrown the gauntlet down. He's in all-out war with the national security establishment over the future direction of America. He's had this breakthrough that says this Cold War that the national security state was brought into existence to wage is a bunch of bull. It's nonsense. It's bunk. He says it's over. It's a racket. And so at American University, he doesn't consult with the military. He doesn't consult with the CIA. He doesn't tell them what he's going to do. He just throws it at them. It's over. Cold War is over. And we are going to have normalized relations with the Soviet Union. Huh. That was throwing the gauntlet down. I mean, remember, General LeMay on the Joint Chiefs of Staff had called Kennedy's resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis the worst defeat in U.S. history. 
and they considered him like Neville Chamberlain at Munich. He was appeasing the communists. Then, then he enters into the nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviets, which, which was anathema to the military and the CIA. He uh, starts ordering a withdrawal of 1,000 troops from Vietnam. Now, they were all advisory troops. He, he was determined not to get America involved in combat. But still, he was starting to pull the troops out. He told aides, as soon as I win the 64 election, I'm pulling them all out. And then worst of all, from the standpoint of the national security state, he was personally negotiating with Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet premier. And a lot of people don't realize this. Personal, personal negotiations, letter to letter, excluding all the, the State Department, the military, the everything. Just one-on-one -on -one negotiations because Khrushchev felt the exact same thing. He experienced the same breakthrough. This is a bunch of bull. It's getting us too close to nuclear war. Let's just normalize relations. Okay, we're a communist regime. You're a so-called capitalist regime. We can still work together. And that was Kennedy's attitude. And that's his peace speech. And uh, it was broadcast all across the Soviet Union. Uh, first time that had ever been done. And then he, then he was negotiating with Castro through third-party intermediaries. So, in fact, there was that intermediary in the very day that, that Kennedy was assassinated who was meeting with, with Fidel Castro on behalf of Kennedy. So the war was on. And so by the time that, that, that Oswald's in New Orleans, it's clear that he's being positioned. He's being postured, that he's a communist, he's a communist. And remember that the truth would only be held by a very small number of people in the CIA. Uh, because uh, he, he is very highly compartmentalized. Uh, so then, he, you know, he's shifted to Mexico City where he's obviously instructed to raise his hubbub uh, with the Soviet embassy and the Cuban embassy, uh, the communists visiting these things, demanding a visa and so forth. And then, after all this, and, and they've got this excellent spy network, the CIA does, down in Mexico City. Uh, they have cameras and so forth. And so, you know, they... they they had all this information, supposedly, and and when he comes back to the United States, nothing, nothing, no alerts, no, hey, this guy's in Dallas, the president's coming to Dallas, nothing. So it's clear that this is a guy who would be in position. Now, we're talking about a young guy, 23, 24 years old. He's like a second lieutenant in the military. He's going to follow orders. Uh, you know, you, you ask a second lieutenant to, to jump, and he'll say, how high? Because, you know, he wants to be a first lieutenant. He wants to be a captain. And so you've got this 20-something-year-old uh, young intelligence agent. He's going to be he's gonna be doing what he's told to do. So when he, he comes back to Dallas and a job becomes available, uh, he takes it there at the school book depository. He's going to do whatever he's told to do. And so he's in the perfect position. Now, if you look at, at his actions after the assassination, they, they do not demark the, 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 the look of a person who's just assassinated the president. For one thing, he supposedly hides the rifle that he supposedly used behind some boxes. Now, if he has just shot the president, what's the point of taking the time to hide a rifle? I mean, it's ridiculous. You're, you're going to get out of there as fast as you can. You're not going to be sitting there trying to hide a rifle because you know they're going to search the whole floor anyway. So what's the point of hiding the rifle? Why are you doing that? You're taking valuable seconds away because the police are going to be swarming and they can lock down that building immediately. Uh, but if you're framing him, you've got to hide that rifle early in the morning. You've got to put it back there so that nobody that's working in the morning is going to see it. Uh, it's got to be planted in advance. And, so, and then Oswald supposedly makes it down to and, you know, like a speedy Gonzalez down to the second floor or so, where he lollygags and buys a soft drink. Because when, when the cop came in, he's there drinking a soft drink. I mean, is that, does that look like a guy that's just committing assassination, wasn't breathing hard or anything? And then when he leaves the building, he takes a bus. And you know, that's not exactly the highest speed way to, you know, escape a, an assassination scene. And he, so he gets on, he walks for a couple blocks, he gets on the bus, and the bus is coming back toward the scene of the crime. And so he gets off the bus and he's going to take a cab home. And uh, a woman's going to, wants to use the cab, and he goes, Oh, yes, ma'am, you take the cab, I'll, I'll get the next one. I mean, this is bizarre. You know, a guy's going to make a quick escape and he's going to let a woman have the, have the cab. And so then he goes home and he ends up getting a gun and ends up at the Texas theater. And so all that's real 
mysterious, no doubt about it. But if this is a man who's been told to do this, he's going to do it. If he's told in advance of the assassination, you are to meet a contact at the Texas Theater, then he's going to be there to meet that contact. Uh, now, we don't know what was going on this, quite mysterious, but here's a possible scenario to contemplate. Somebody once shared this with me, that they tell Oswald, look, we are going to infiltrate you into Cuba. Uh, we need you to assassinate Castro. We, we've had this partnership with the mafia. We, we, it has not been successful. We, we just have not been able to assassinate him. But you can get in. You can get close to him because you're this communist who's been to the Soviet Union. So this is going to be your mission. Leave all your valuables at home. Don't tell your wife. Don't say anything. This, this is your mission. Highly dangerous. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But the president's coming into town, and the president's well aware of your your, your, the great job you're doing, the great job you did in the Soviet Union, he wants to meet with you. And so meet at the Texas Theater. You'll meet your contact there. They will take you to see President Kennedy, and then we're going to get you on a plane. We're going to get you over into Cuba. So to me, it's a reasonable scenario. I mean, it, it, there, there's nothing unusual about it, given their quest to assassinate Castro. And so when, when Oswald all of a sudden is arrested by law enforcement officers, Obviously, he would be quite surprised, which he obviously was. Uh, so they, they take him into custody at, at around 2 p.m. Now, or 1 p.m. Central Time. Now, here's the thing. When, when, this, when this setup is taking place, the, the, the mindset is that they got to get rid of it. I mean, they can't afford to have him talk. And so my hunch is that they plan to kill him at the Texas School Book Depository. Silence him right there. Instead, he gets away and, and he's silenced uh, a couple of days later. Uh, now, clearly Oswald did blow his cover, or we don't know that because they didn't record any of the interviews with him. Uh, but it's likely that he was trying to protect his cover. But he kept saying, you know, I need it. Would somebody come forward and help me out? Would somebody come forward? Like he's speaking out to the intelligence community. And he says, I want counsel. But when a lawyer shows up, the head of the Dallas Bar Association, he says no, because he clearly wanted somebody that within the agency that was going to come and release him. He, he it still had not dawned on him what was going on, except that when he says, I'm a patsy, it, he had to be figuring out what was going on here. Now, OK, so how do they do this? Well, remember, they have shooters from the front and Oswald's in the back, you know. Does that make any sense? Now, how do we know they had shooters from the front? Well, we have that, remember the press conference the, doc, the Dallas doctors gave right after the assassination where they said he had an entry wound here and then a large wound in the back of his head. And remember Sandra Spencer's testimony that she saw the photographs, the real photographs of the autopsy showing the big back of the head wound in the occipital region. Remember the Harper fragment? It was occipital bone. The witnesses that got splattered in the back. All the Dallas treating physicians at the time of the assassination said that he had this huge exit wound, which is why they knew they could not save his, his life there in the back of the head in the occipital region. So, you know, everybody knew there that he had been shot from the front. Okay, so why would you do that? If you're going to frame a guy in the rear, why, why shoot him from the front? Well, that was the ingenious part of this thing. You see, this is an assassination of a president. So they knew that in the assassination of a president, the investigators were going to pull out all the stops. This is standard. I mean, you kill a cop, and man, they're, every cop is swarming into the area. They're, they're going to do whatever's necessary to, to, uh, to catch you. Uh, or you kill a federal judge or a federal prosecutor or whatever. I guarantee you they're not going to pull any punches of going after you, you know, even if it's, if it's illegal, you know, listening on your t lawyer's communications, whatever. They are going to get you. Well, the same thing applies to a president. They're going to pull out all the stops. And so the, the plotters had to know that. So they had to figure out a way to shut down the investigation. And that's the ingenious part of this thing. So this is what they do. They have the f shots fired from the front. And then... What does that mean? Well, they've got Oswald in the rear, who no one questions that Oswald was, was innocent here. I mean, th th that he was guilty. I mean, they, everybody was convinced. Okay, Oswald is, is the given that that's a shooter. 
but they've also got shooters from the front. So who would his Confederates be? It's clearly now it's a conspiracy because you got a shooter from the back and, and shooters from the front. So who would those Confederates from the front be or one Confederate? Well, there can only be one answer. Uh, given this set of facts, shooter in the back, shooter, shooters in the front, there can be only one reasonable answer. Uh, it could be his co-workers. I mean, what, what sense would that make? He had just started working there recently. It could be any friends. He didn't have any friends. So who would it be? It's logical. Communists. I mean, this is what the whole deal was, going to the Soviet embassy, the Cuban embassy, this, uh, defecting to the Soviet Union. There would be no other possibility than those shooters that put that entry wound here and the exit wound over here were communists from the Soviet Union, Cuba, combination of the two. Okay, so that's the set of facts they're dealing with at this point. Okay, well, what does that mean? We're talking about war here. This is the Soviet Union the Cuba, and the Cuban, the communists, who have just killed the president in the Cold War. That's an act of war. Okay, what does that mean? That means all-out nuclear war here. They had come within an inch of nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And now here we are. We are now facing the very real prospect of nuclear war. Because we can't let them get away with this. I mean, what are we going to do? Just let them kill the president and just drop it? They could have done that. But here's the kicker. It was the so it was the CIA that had started the assassination game. Okay? They were the ones that were out there trying to assassinate Castro in partnership with the mafia, which was the premier private organization that was specializing in assassination. So how do you go to war over an assassination of the by supposedly the communists when you're the one that started the game of the of the commun of the, of the assassinations? it's not, not really logical. I mean, what do you, you go on national television saying they killed the president here, the communists did, and so we are here ordering a massive counterattack on the Soviet Union without mentioning that you were the one that did this? And so faced with this set of facts, the, the ostensible cover here is we can't do this. we got to just pin the thing on Oswald. He did it anyway and drop the rest. And by dropping the rest, that means no investigation into the rest. In other words, it's, it's all Oswald and that's it. And that ensures that there's no investigation that's going to lead to the national security establishment. And sure enough, on the, on the very day of the assassination, Henry Wade, the prosecutor in Dallas County, remember, this was a state murder case. He charges Oswald with murder as part of a communist conspiracy, international communist conspiracy. And... Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, telephones him. They knew each other. Johnson was a native Texan and says, get rid of that in, that charge immediately. What are you trying to do? Start world war here? This is national security. Get rid of that charge. And then the FBI swoops in and starts you know, taking control over the investigation, even though they had no jurisdiction. And so Wade complies. This is national security. And so this is, this is where Johnson's role, remember Johnson had a double role. I mentioned that early on. One, get the body out of Parkland without an autopsy. And two, conjure up the image of nuclear war. So now he's doing this with Wade. You can't charge a communist conspiracy here. This is our bailiwick. This is national security stuff. And then he, when he's talking to Earl Warren, to try to convince him to join the Warren Commission. Warren did not want to do this. He said, I'm on the Supreme Court. I'm not going to get involved in these kind of collateral issues here. I'm, I'm devoting my attention to my job at the Supreme Court. Johnson conjures up the image of a nuclear war. He says, you owe your country this. We're looking at the possibility of 40 million Americans dying in a nuclear war. Now, what could he mean by that? I mean, this is if this is a lone nut, how does this lead to nuclear war? It was because they knew the shots had been fired from the front. And by the shots fired from the front, that means a communist conspiracy. They had to shut that down to prevent that from happening. So that Warren would know his job on this, this commission would be just to make it a brief, a prosecutor's brief that, that ties in Oswald and that's it. Nothing further. And then he, and Johnson does the same thing with Earl Warren. I mean with Ru uh, Richard Russell who was another member, who said, I'm not going to serve on this thing. He hated Earl Warren. He says, I'm not going to serve on any commission with Earl Warren. And Johnson brings up the possibility of World War III here.
So Johnson's bringing up this concept based on the fact that these shots had been fired from the front. That leads us to the autopsy, which started this whole series. Remember I told you that by understanding the autopsy, you would have a better understanding of the assassination? All right, well, now we're coming back to the, to the, the assassination to understand the autopsy. The purpose of the autopsy is to hide the fact that these two shots were fired from the front to go back and show that they all came from the rear in order to prevent World War III. Uh, and, and so it would have been a no-brainer to get you know a couple of incompetent pathologists, uh, which is what they would have wanted, so that they could say, oh, well, yeah, it was messy, but it was because of their incompetence. Uh, and, and, and then swear them to secrecy and make them vow that they, they will follow orders and never reveal it. And once a military man makes a vow of secrecy, especially directly to the president or to a top official, secretary of defense or whatever, he's never going to break that vow. Never in his life. He's going to take it to the grave with him. And so it would have been no, no difficulty at all to say, this is World War III we're looking at. You will follow orders. And if you can't follow orders, let us know. We'll find somebody else that does. But your country needs you now. Your country needs you to hide the fact that these shots were fired from the front. So it doesn't mean that the pathologists were part of the assassination. It simply means that they were part of a cover-up and doing unwittingly, unknowingly, thinking that they were serving their country. And so that was the whole idea of, of, of uh, the fake bogus photographs that show the back of the head intact. It's, it's why they were having trouble here with the, initially with this throat wound. That was the genesis of the magic bullet theory. Uh, you have an entry wound here. They don't know how to handle this exactly. Remember that deep state guy tells Colonel Fink, don't touch that wound. Don't even deal with it because they're obviously still trying to figure out what to do. And they, they finally decide, well, let's move the shoulder wound up to the back of the neck, make it into a magic bullet, come back through the front, hit Conley, go through his ribs, um, break his wrist, end up in his left leg through sort of a zigzag motion and come out totally pristine. Impossible. I mean, this, this is why they call it the magic bullet or the pristine bullet, because the bullet is perfectly intact. It's like a brand new bullet with just a little bit of, of, of notches, uh, notches on, the, on the bottom base of the, of the bullet. Uh, so this is what they were doing in the autopsy. This is the idea of sneaking the body in early. Now, here's a little interesting tidbit that uh, might interest you. The, the two drivers were, uh, for, the, for the Kennedy limousine were Greer and Kellerman. And these are two Secret Service guys. Now, people swear, lots of people swear, that after the first shot, the limousine made a complete stop until Kennedy gets hit in the head, and then it takes off. The Zabruder film, which we've discussed, doesn't show that. It shows the car slowing down, but it doesn't show a complete stop, and, and which has caused some people to believe that the film was altered by the removal of frames. And remember, we discussed how the this, 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 the, the film ends up in the hands of the CIA on the very weekend of the assassination where they fly it to Washington and then they fly it to, to their top secret plant in New York, in Rochester, New York, where the CIA photography experts say that plant could do anything. And there was no reason for them to send it to that plant because they could watch the film in Washington, but they've never explained what they were doing up there at, the, at that plant. Uh, but that has caused some people to believe that frames were removed because, like I say, a large number of people said that car made a complete stop. Uh, but here's here's a thing that's undisputed: that, that Kellerman in the, in the passenger seat, he doesn't after the first shot jump over the seat and cover President Kennedy with his body, which is his role. That's his responsibility. Remember, the job of a Secret Service agent is to give his life for the president. He sits there like a bump on the log. Unlike Rufus Youngblood, who was uh, with Johnson, he immediately jumped over his seat and, when he heard the shots and put himself over Johnson. Or remember Clint Hill, who was rushing to try to get to the Kennedy limousine, grabs onto the end of it, pushes Mrs. Kennedy into the rear, and immediately covers the president in case there are any more shots. Kellerman sat there like a bump on the lot. Now, the reason this is interesting is because if we then go to Bethesda, where the, where the autopsy is taking place, these two guys, Greer and Kellerman, are part of the body switching uh, episode. Uh, remember, they after they snuck the body in and, and they got it into the morgue uh, early, 6.35 p.m., uh, they, they uh, 
had to get the body back into the Dallas casket in order to bring it into the front of the building for its official entry. Well, guess who was orchestrating that body switching and putting it back into the Dallas casket? That would be Greer and Kellerman. So they, they had some interesting they had an interesting day on the on the assassination. Now here's the other interesting twist to this. That when they have this story that 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 you know prospect of World War III and so forth, nuclear attack. Remember we've talked about Johnson lollygagging and stuff at, at, at Parkland uh, at the airport in Dallas Left Field where it was, it's clear that he didn't worry at all that this was a nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. Um, if they had killed Kennedy and Oswald at the school book depository, then they could have argued that they were doing this because they had this communist in custody and uh, that they, uh, they, they were trying to protect against you know, this possibility of nuclear war. However, because Oswald wasn't arrested for an hour or so, that is before they could determine that he was a communist, the World War III scenario doesn't really pan out for them. Because remember, the fraudulent autopsy scheme is launched uh, immediately when President Kennedy is declared dead. That's at 1 p.m. And that's before they have the communist in custody and questioned and determining that he's a communist. So they've launched the plan early. So they can't say, well, we thought we were doing the right thing for the country here, because at that point, they don't know who's, presumably, don't know who's committed the assassination. So the, the World War III scenario doesn't work in terms of how they're, they constructed this thing. Uh, but it worked after they got to Washington and they start developing this scenario of, oh my gosh, this is going to lead to World War III. Because by this time, Oswald's been taken into custody and then, of course, later died. And that's how they tie it in with his Confederates. But at the moment that the, that the whole autopsy scheme is launched, put into play, where Johnson's ordering, presumably ordering the Secret Service team to get that body out of Parkland at all costs and get it in the hands of the military, it's 1 p.m., before they've had a chance to even question Oswald, bring him into custody. That's how they pulled off this remarkable, brilliant, and cunning scheme.